you are. We need you to share the screen. He is. All right. So please share your screen with your presentation. <clears throat> and then we'll let you start. You cannot share your screen. Let's see. Hold on. We have our technical experts working on this. It should be. You should be allowed. You could try making him a co host. There it goes, it's working. Okay. All right, so Mehmet Baikara from the University of California Merced uh, is the next speaker. Uh, uh, Mehmet, I will give you a, we wanna leave three minutes for questions, so I'll, I'll give you a two minute warning before that. Okay, the floor is yours. I uh, can't turn on my microphone, ah, uh -uh, okay. Uh, we will check, it does not look like you're muted. Host is not allowing it. Okay. Can you okay, try now? Try now. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Wait, Sorry for that. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, yeah, you can still hear me, right? Yes, we can. You're okay, good to perfect, go. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let me uh, switch this to the full screen mode. Okay. I guess you can see my screen as well. Perfect. Okay. So um, as already indicated, my name is Mehmet Baikara. I'm an associate professor of mechanical engineering here in California at UC Merced. Uh, today, I will be talking about new avenues in structural superlubricity. You can also call this new, um, new questions in structural superlubricity. Specifically, we will be talking about contact aging and friction switches. And this is work that has been performed by my PhD student, Wei Wu, who's, a, who's an NSF fellow working on this project with me. Um, before I start, let me thank the organizers, Ariel, uh, Ernst, uh, Andrea, and, and Quan Chi Zeng for um, giving us a chance to present our work here. I really wish I could be in Trieste for this um, with two kids at home and, and, uh, and COVID, it was unfortunately not possible, but I really enjoyed my last time there in person. So hopefully next time I will be able to come in person uh, as well. And Mehmet, if you are able to turn your uh, video on, we can have oh. your smiling yeah. face. Uh, I, I, I tried, that. but I was not allowed either, and I didn't want to take too much of your time. So, um, yeah, it says host has stopped my video, so I cannot turn it on. All um, right. If go you ahead. can go ahead, then. Sorry about that. that. That's okay. Um, so yeah, I'll just I'll just go on and start my talk. Then, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, so all right, today we will be talking about the concept of structural superlubricity. Uh, usually my first slide is about the importance of friction, but I guess uh, for this audience, this is, uh, this is not relevant. So we'll just start with this structural superlubricity business. So if you take a look at this or think about this from a very macroscopic point of view, uh, what it involves is essentially um, two surfaces that are structurally incommensurate. So uh, a good way to visualize this can be found on Wikipedia. Let's imagine you have these two um, egg cartons or egg crates, if you will, on top of each other. If you place them such that the hills of one crate fit exactly into the wells of the other, you have uh, what we call interlocking. So the two objects are interlocked to each other. And if you try to slide one with respect to each other, you will face a lot of resistance. So uh, yeah, that's, that's probably very easy to imagine. Now take one of these crates, specifically the one on the top, let's call that the slider, and then let's rotate it a little bit. When we do this little bit of rotation, well, the hills of the first crate cannot fit anymore into the wells of the, of the second crate. And you have what we call a structurally incommensurate alignment. In this case, uh, the slider essentially floats on the substrate and it is very easy to, uh, to slide it um, laterally. And I think I was just able to turn my, on my video, so that's good. Um, so, okay, so this is the macroscopic sort of um, demonstration or maybe a visualization of what we mean by structural superlubricity. Now let's go on to uh, a much smaller length scale. Let's go to the length scale of atoms and see how it applies there. Okay, so when we talk about structural superlubricity on a, on a very small length scale, uh, what we can do is the following um, thought experiment uh, as, as proposed by Hirscher, Schirmeisen and Schwartz here in their 2008 review. So let's imagine we have a one dimensional uh, substrate. So to make things easy, let's do this a 1D linear substrate. Let's make it crystalline such that we have a fixed distance uh, between the atoms of the, of the substrate. And then let's imagine we have the smallest slider we can think of. 
uh, on this substrate. So the smallest thing we can think of if you're an engineer or, or physicist is usually an atom. So let's put an atom on this, uh, on this substrate. So if this was a macroscopic scenario, what happened would be, uh, what, what would happen uh, is that this, this ball would try to fall into a well to minimize its gravitational potential energy. Well, we're in a very small length scale, so gravitation doesn't matter to these atoms. But what matters is that they have um, interactions between them. So what we see here is a very regular interaction potential uh, that this uh, slider atom experiences on this, um, on this substrate. So what it does is it falls into a potential energy well, and then in order to move this slider on the substrate to move it, let's say one spot to the right, to the next well, we have to overcome this energy barrier here. Okay, that's, what, that's what causes resistance to motion, which manifests as friction. Now, if we go ahead and make the slider larger, instead of one atom, let's have two atoms, but also impose the condition that the distance between these atoms is, is a fixed one, so a crystalline uh, slider, that is different from the distance between the um, uh, atoms of the substrate, we have, again, structural incommensurability. We cannot have the two atoms of the slider in the wells. So what they have to do is they have to rise up in the potential energy landscape. So although the number of atoms sliding has increased, the energy barrier per atom has decreased. And this is the whole idea behind structural superlubricity. As you have an increase in contact area, potential energy barrier per atom decreases. So you end up with a friction force that doesn't scale linearly with number of atoms or contact area, but sublinearly. And this power factor that defines the sublinear relationship is um, between zero and 0 0.5. You can read uh, papers by, by Astrid DeWine, by Andre Schirmeisen, where they nicely describe this. It all depends on the, um, on the shape um, um, and the relative orientation of the slider with respect to the substrate. So that's the whole idea behind structural superlubricity. As you get larger and larger contacts, you get a very modest increase in friction, which results in nearly frictionless sliding. Well, this sounds very good and it's, it's, all, it's all fantastic. You have low friction, that's all what we all want in many of the applications, but it's also, um, when you read about it, a bit unrealistic because there are multiple conditions that need to be met uh, for, this, uh, for this situation to occur. You need essentially atomically flat surfaces for both the slider and the substrate because edge effects tend to destroy this relationship. And then you need to have a molecularly clean interface because if you have mobile molecules at the interface, as nicely um, described by Martin Muser in one of his papers, um, or maybe a couple of his papers, what these molecules do is they wander around the interface, find themselves nice potential minima to sit in, and essentially lock the two surfaces together such that this state of structural incommensurability breaks down. So um, therefore it's, it's rather unrealistic when you first think about it. Well, this is a nice theoretical exercise, but how do we make this work? Um, so a lot of this work, experimental work um, targeting structural superlubricity has been performed under UHV conditions. But you may remember this paper that we published in our group a few years ago, where we have shown that it is indeed um, possible to achieve quantitatively verified structural superlubricity by for friction force versus contact area spectroscopy, essentially, if you utilize a material system that consists of gold nano islands on graphite. So you create gold nano islands on graphite by thermal deposition, you push them around with, a, um, with the tip of your atomic force microscope, you end up with very low friction forces, essentially for more than 30 islands here, you can see results summarized uh, with friction forces below one nanonewton. When you look at the contact areas that are um, being measured here, this is indeed a very low value. For comparison, one can take a look at um, antimony island measurements on graphite performed nicely by uh, Andre Schirmeisen's group uh, and Dirk Dietzel. And they saw friction forces for antimony islands that are at least, or not at least, but about two orders of magnitude larger than this. So we have ultra low friction for this material system under ambient conditions which is rather nice because you can think about all sorts of applications potentially uh, for um, small scale mechanical systems that nearly um, that slide nearly frictionless. However, there are a lot of remaining questions to realize these sort of uh, holy grail goals. Um, how does structural superlubricity uh, behave with respect to sliding speed, with respect to changes in temperature? Is there a context size limit for this? There are theoretical predictions that there are. And another question is, how does structural superlubricity stand uh, the test of time, so to say? Or how, how do we have contact aging, essentially, for structurally superlubric contacts? So when you think about contact aging, one of the first papers that come to mind is, um, is this one by Rob Karpik's group uh, in Nature from 2011. 
essentially what they have shown is using a silicon oxide tip and a silicon oxide wafer. Uh, they're doing slide stop slide experiments. Essentially, they wait a certain amounts of time before they initiate sliding between these two um, objects. And what they find is that the static friction, the friction value that needs to be overcome to bring this material system to motion is linearly, or sorry, logarithmically increasing with time, as you can see right here. The more time the slider spends on the substrate, the higher the static friction goes. Well, in this paper, this was explained through um, formation of chemical bonds over time uh, for a structurally superlibric contact. It's an interesting question whether a similar effect would be observed. And this is uh, sort of what we tried to address here. Um, so what we do is essentially, again, the same material system, gold islands on graphite. Most of the gold items are accumulated on graphite step edges as expected, as you can see here, but we occasionally have nice ones that are on terraces like this. Uh, we go ahead and use the tip on top manipulation method. So what we do is we go and image our material system, a particular region of the surface in tapping mode AFM in a light fashion in order not to initiate any sort of motion. We locate an island we are interested in, we land on the island with our tip, and do contact mode scanning essentially in an area that is obviously smaller than the uh, upper surface of the island. When we do this, because of the superlibric character of the material system, instead of the tip sliding on the island, what ends up happening is that the tip drags the island as it goes to the right and left, as it's doing these scans, and the measured friction forces are essentially the friction forces that are at the interface between the island and the graphite. And you get friction, uh, sorry, topography maps like this that look rather flat, if you take a look here, it's, it's rather tight, a color bar. So you get flat topography maps that prove that the tip is not moving up or down during this motion and it's just dragging the island laterally. Okay, so performing these tip on top measurements on our gold graphite material system, what we observe is essentially uh, three different effects uh, that are interesting. So the first one is called the rejuvenation effect. We very often observe that the friction value measured uh, for the first manipulation we perform on a particular island is significantly higher than subsequent manipulations. So we go ahead and do a scan, slide the island left and right, left and right, and stop. And then do it again. We usually do this five times for a given island. And the first uh, value, the first friction value, which we infer from friction force maps that are rather homogeneous like this, is typically much higher than the, subs than the, than the other ones. So, the second effect that we see is similar in character, but a little bit different. This is called the aging effect, or we just coined this, the aging effect. What we observe is the following. So you have uh, your first island, I mean, the only island you're looking at in this experiment, you're sliding it, you're doing five different experiments, then you go and uh, have an extended lunch for four hours, come back to the lab, measure the same island again, and now you again see that the initial friction value that you measure is much higher than the subsequent ones. So this, um, this value that we had is actually back in the first experiment, is back in the second experiment after waiting for a certain amount of time. So we call this the aging effect. And then finally, something um, that is a little bit different is the switching or the friction switches that we occasionally or sometimes pretty often see uh, on some of the islands. What we see is essentially during these manipulations that we perform on a single island, we observe a switch between high and friction low branch, high and low friction branches. So as you can see right here in this one scan, uh, this is a friction map uh, belonging to a single nano, nano island that we have. We have a high friction region. This is that bright part. And then at some point, this is a top-down scan. So at some point, there's an abrupt change. Something happens, and then we switch to a low friction region. We don't only have high to low switches, we also have low to high switches, depending on the experiment. So again, we have this switching happening quite often, depending on the type of island we look at. And we often observe a combination of all these three trends. You can have the, um, this rejuvenation effect, you can have the aging effect, this is the same island on the left and right, but measured uh, in a, uh, with 18 hours apart between the measurements. And then you can have the switches in this case from low to high friction branches. So we can see a combination of all three trends. Obviously experimentally, these are all very interesting and the fact we can observe them is due, um, due, to, the, um, due to the reason that we're doing the tip on top manipulations where we have control over the speed, over the distance, over the direction in which we push the islands, which we didn't have in that 2016 paper I showed earlier where we were just pushing the islands 
from the side, uh, recording some friction values, and they, they at some point they just flew away and they could never find them again. So now with this method, we could do the um, we can do the experiments much more controllably and have much more data. Okay, so um, how much time do I have left? Uh, how much? Four minutes. Four minutes. Okay, good, good. So uh, this should be enough. So we these these experiments that I showed you were performed on a sample set that we um, coined big islands because the average island size here. I mean, what we mean here is the contact size between the islands and the substrate was about thirty-four thousand nanometers square. In order to probe if we have potential size effects, we repeated the experiments on three different sets of samples that are smaller. So we had extremely small small and the medium range islands. We control the size by changing the parameters of our um, gold deposition on graphite. And interestingly, in all of these three samples, we rarely observed any of these three effects. I'm gonna summarize this more in a coming slide. But before I do that, let me also say, we start observing some sort of dynamic contamination layer on these samples. Because remember, these experiments are done under ambient conditions. Typically after a month or a month and a half, so this is a phase image that you see on the left-hand side and the dark regions you see here are a, a dynamic contamination layer. The height is only a few angstroms. So these are probably molecules lying down on the surface in a monolayer fashion. Um, so um, the experiments that we do are partially done on fresh samples where we don't observe this contamination right after synthesis. And then some of the experiments we do are after several months uh, after the islands are synthesized. So those are contaminated, those are islands that have been investigated under contaminated conditions. And we see a distinct difference between the two types. So I know this is a complicated table, but let me just tell you, let me just quickly go over what we see here and uh, I will have one more slide after this. So essentially what we have is a summary of all the experiments we performed over the past couple of years. On the, on the rows, you see fresh islands and contaminated islands. And on the columns, you see the four different groups of islands we discussed in terms of size, smallest, small, medium range, and big. And as you can see, um, once we perform experiments on the big islands, when they're in a fresh state, we see all three effects quite frequently. And our definition of frequency is uh, right here on the lower hand side. So more than 75% of the time. When these islands become contaminated, we see the three effects, but less frequently, as you can see over here. What's perhaps even more interesting is when we perform experiments on the smaller islands, we rarely observe any of these effects or don't observe them at all. Um, so, and the numbers are right here. What's missing here, the missing piece of the puzzle here, as you can see is experiments on smaller islands that are performed when they are in a fresh state. And this is, um, this is one of our goals uh, for, the next, for the next year. So a couple of questions, why are these contact aging effects not observed at the small islands? And why do these spontaneous switches between the friction branches occur? And why do we not see them for the smaller islands? There are possible explanations we think about inspired from the literature. There could be a dislocation mechanism that's, that's involved. Maybe um, some of the smaller islands don't have this mechanism and the larger ones do. Maybe there's a lubricant layer at the interface. Water has been suggested by Schirmeisen's group before. Maybe we have other surface contamination effects. Uh, we actually observe surface contamination. So maybe that has an effect in terms of uh, size and, and um, what friction values we measure. In order to answer these questions, we are collaborating with the group of Professor Martin Muser from the University of Saarland, who I believe um, gave a talk earlier today. And uh, yeah, we're, we're in the process of trying to understand uh, what's happening in these experiments in terms of a um, theoretical explanation. And uh, the remaining tasks for the experiments I have, already, um, I have already gone over. Well, this brings me to the end of my talk. As you can see from my video, I'm in a very, um, not well lit location. I'm in the garage of my house. And the reason is, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I will show you the reason in a second. We have, uh, yeah, these two guys screaming in the house right now. So yeah, we have two little babies. So I have been, it's Memorial Day here. So daycare is closed and I've been banished to the garage, but yeah, um, still, um, yeah was able to give the talk, which is good. So we have our lab website right here. It's frequently updated. If you're interested in what we do, we just, we don't only do nanotribology work. We also do other AFM um, based experiments. So please take a look there. We have our Twitter accounts. Also, if you're on social media, feel free to follow us. And this is for the lab. And this is for, um, this is for Ray, my student, uh, our NSF fellow uh, who did all the measurements here. 
Uh, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. I apologize if I went over time and I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Okay, we do have a couple minutes for questions. And they can come from the room, they can come from online. Or over here. A uh, very interesting talk. Uh, when you mention surface contaminants, have you have you seen any? I mean, have you taken any FM imaging after after doing your friction friction force uh, measurements? Yeah, yeah. So the the typical image we see on a on, this is rather large scale, but the typical image we see on a on a contaminated sample looks like this. And we are not showing it here, but what's interesting is when you go ahead and do a manipulation, oh, these, these are actually islands. So like this little thing over here and that, that guy, these are gold islands. We actually went ahead and did manipulations on these deliberately. And when you bring the tip over there and move the island, the, the contamination layer changes, it's, it's dynamic. So um, the shapes that you see right now after a manipulation will change. Um, so there's certainly something going on in terms of interactions between the islands between the tip moving the islands around and the contamination we see on the surface. Um, we're thinking maybe even some of the, um, um, some of these switches or aging effects we see have to do with contaminant molecules entering and exiting the interface between the gold and graphite, but we're, we're, we need um, theoretical support for, for that idea. Okay, we have time for one more maybe focused question. Uh, Oh, there is something in the chat. No, it, it's uh, not a question. Perhaps I have one, yeah. one, very, one very quick one. Uh, for the switches between the branches, do you know what's underneath the island uh, when these uh, switches happen? Because you're dragging it around, but I guess like if you know the topology below, that might be mm -hmm. yeah, this is, yeah, this is the classic problem of buried interface in surface science. Um, in these AFM experiments, we have no way of seeing uh, what's under the islands at what's what's at the interface essentially as we are moving them around. Whatever we can infer is from these force measurements. Um, but trying to address your point, we did a few measurements that involved um, topographically investigating the locations where the islands were before they were manipulated. So we, we had an island, we moved it, and then we took a look at the location where it was sitting before. Um, when we did that, we didn't see any, um, any indication of uh, um, something happening on the surface. So nothing that looks different from the surroundings in terms of the graphite surface. So it, that, that um, investigation was uh, essentially um, um, inconclusive. But yeah, I wish we could see what was happening at the interface, but perhaps molecular dynamics simulations can help us understand what's going on there. Okay, with that, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Thanks. We'll move on to our last talk uh, of the session. Uh, Elisa Riedo, hopefully, is online.